1937, Charles Cooper, a retired butler and former footman, published his memoirs. And uh, he certainly had a very interesting life. Actually, there were a number of servants in the 19th and early 20th centuries who produced memoirs or uh, wrote diaries. And today we're going to look at some of them because they really do give us a very vivid insight into their everyday lives. We're going to be reading extracts from their stories and from the writings of their employers to find out what servants got up to when they weren't actually working. First up is Hannah Kulick. Now she was a maid in London in the 19th century and a very prolific diary writer. Walter and me ain't such good friends as we was. He's so rude and he swears so I can't abide it. So I give up my wrestling bouts with him for I used to get him down, lay him on the floor, on his back, though he's only 20 years old and strong. <laughs> but that was only a game for the kitchen. But Walter was so mad at being mastered by me, he hit me hard. So I said I wasn't going to romp with him no more. Oh, and Emily <laughs> kisses her often enough. And she's so fine and smart about her work. She wears gloves to clean the grate. <laughs> and spends most of her wages in dressing fine on a Sunday. So she despises me with me old things. Well, we'll hear more from Hannah later on. Now, in a, a large servant household, meal times were usually a time when most of the indoor servants would come together to take their meals in the servants' hall. Mind you, it wasn't necessarily um, a relaxed social occasion because there were strict protocols, rules and discipline, everybody being reminded of exactly where they stood in the pecking order. The food itself would vary from one household to another for various reasons, including who actually cooked it because it would usually be one of the kitchen maids cooking for the servants. When the family were away from home, the servants would have to cook their own meals. Now they were given extra money to do this with, it was known as board wages. And we're gonna hear from Charles Cooper now on one such occasion when he was on board wages. We were on board wages for a time. The first footman, doing the catering for us men and trying to do things as cheaply as possible, ordered a piece of belly pork. This salted meat, he thought, would save a lot of extra cooking. Well, it must have been a yard long, and as each mealtime came around, upon investigation, we found that it was still belly of pork. I think it was used at last to replace a broken paving stone in the yard. You know, in any large servant household, it would pay a prudent employer to keep an eye on not just what the servants were eating, but who exactly was eating it. Sir John Ramsden of Bulstrode Park carried out such a check on one occasion and found that the postman was having his dinner every day in the servants' hall as well as the servants. Well, I think it's um, pretty well known that servants in the 19th century didn't get very much time off and holidays were something of a rarity. Mrs Beaton, in her book of household management, recommended that... In the country, one week off per year, but servants should expect no other holiday though few would deny a day to a willing servant. In London, no weekly holiday should be allowed, but every six weeks or so, one whole day off should be given. After four years' service, I was offered a holiday, as the family were paying a round of visits lasting six weeks, and those servants who cared to take a holiday did so. Very few did in those days, the 1880s, and no servant would dream of asking for one unless the family were away from home. The butler and housekeeper arranged the allotted time for each. My first holiday was three days. Quite enough at that time. 
Our cottage homes and food were no comparison with what we had left behind. Well, if holidays were a rarity, lucky servants could expect to get an occasional afternoon or evening off. But maids, if they were going to leave the house, would probably be inspected by the housekeeper to make sure they were dressing respectably and given plenty of advice on what to do, how to behave and more likely where not to go. In 1842, the Religious Tract Society warned servants against a love of pleasure and a desire to visit fairs, races, theatres, tea gardens and similar places of low amusement where they are thrown into bad society and see and hear things by which their abhorrence of vice is weakened. So they weren't supposed to enjoy themselves too much when they went out. And you know, some employers felt that servants shouldn't be made too comfortable either. Here's one mistress writing in a publication called From Kitchen to Garret. No carpet should be allowed in any room where servants live or move or have their being. Coconut matting or a couple of strong curd rugs could be put on the floor of the servants' hall. If the servants are responsible and trustworthy, an old sofa or a comfortable armchair or two might be installed which they can rest in when their work is over. But if the servants are young, heedless or have not lived time in the establishment, these little additions to their comfort are not necessary. But some employers did provide servants with uh, respectable and worthwhile things to do in their spare time, such as drawing or reading lessons. The Duchess of Connaught, who was very fond of music, encouraged her servants in this respect, and a piano for their use was installed in the servants' hall. It was very much appreciated, and in a very short time, even the newcomers could play very well. A few took music lessons, and these helped the others in their first attempts. There are always good singers to be found in large or small houses, and everyone knows that singing with music makes all the difference to a happy evening. I have often gone down to the servants' hall to listen to a good song and have been surprised at the talent that was under our own roof. You might have been surprised to hear of servants playing musical instruments, but actually it wasn't that unusual. You often come across stories of uh, the fiddle and the concertina being played in the servants' hall and occasionally more expensive instruments like the flute. Some servants obviously found time to take up other hobbies as well. In the old days, one used to meet footmen who collected crested livery buttons, putting them in cases, or crests from stationery and pasted them in albums, did fretwork, making brackets, pipe racks, picture frames, etc., and French polished them, did silk and wool work, studied languages, hoping this would help them to secure a good place as a valet to travel abroad with some gentleman. Others would take up music, the banjo being a popular instrument. You probably weren't expecting to hear of men doing some form of lace and wool work, needlework of some sort, but it's true. At that place, I learnt to do crochet work and I could beat any girl at making lace and wool. During my years in service, I made dozens of little jackets for babies. In fact, I think the women used to have the babies in order to get the little wool jackets. The Duchess of Portland was also very keen on keeping her footman fit. Nobody wanted a fat footman. So she provided her footman with a bicycle, a set of golf clubs and judo lessons from a judo expert in their own fully equipped gymnasium. Now, musical talent would always be appreciated, of course, when it came to parties. And servants did occasionally have parties, often without their employers knowing about it. In 1872, Hannah Kulick organised a secret birthday party for one of the maids. We bought some crumpets and everything extras we wanted. Miss Sister Ellen came in 
and Walter to tea and Mr and Mrs Shyak and also the parlour maid came in after she'd cleared the dinner. Oh and then we had oranges and nuts and port wine all drinking her health and the music box was at play every now and then but we had to be quiet so as we wasn't heard upstairs. I got the supper at nine and then Ellen paid for a lobster salad and with that and our usual bread and cheese it was enough. Oh and I paid for the extra beer. Oh we all enjoyed ourselves and we sung what songs we knowed. We was ordered to prayers oh about ten so our company had to sit very quiet till we came down again. Then I got the parlour supper, cleared out and got up to bed by eleven. But in large households, servants were usually allowed to have a ball once a year, probably around Christmas time. Although at Longleat apparently, they had dances twice a week in the servants hall. Still, a servants hall was a, a large room, I suppose it made an ideal dance room or party room. William Lansley, at one of his places of employment in Scotland, remembers the annual ball that they used to have. He said that the master and her ladyship would come down to the servants' hall and dance with the servants. The master would start off with the housekeeper and her ladyship with the butler. And then they'd stay dancing with the servants until supper time. At Welbeck Abbey, the Duke of Portland held an annual ball on Twelfth Night. And it was a very grand and formal affair. 1,200 guests, all the servants, all the staff, the tenants, the tradesmen. Frederick Gorst, one of the footmen, recalls the scene for us. The rooms were beautifully decorated, just as though the Duke and Duchess were giving a ball for themselves. An orchestra from London was engaged, and a swarm of 50 waiters arrived because none of us were required to perform any duties that evening. This was the social event of our season. It was quite a revelation to see all the members of the staff in ball dress. Even the prim head housemaid looked quite chic in a velvet gown, and the head housekeeper, who wore a low-cut blue satin gown, was almost unrecognisable. I found that we had acquired a new kind of individuality and gaiety for the evening, and, stranger still, that we were all seeing each other from a new aspect, as people, not servants. At the Duke of Sutherland's London residence, Thomas, one of the footmen, was the main organiser of the servants' annual ball. He organised the decorations, the lights and the drink. The steward gave us two bottles of brandy and two rum, but no wine was allowed, so I got up a collection. I put five shillings in myself and collected a shilling from each of the other servants. This made one pound sixteen shillings. So I gave 16 shillings to the violin players, and with the rest, I bought extra drink. The household provided two sittings of supper in the servants' hall, and as much ale as we wanted. The dancing carried on till early morning. Some of the maids went away about three, but there was most of them that stayed till the finish, which was about seven or half past. We had tea in the servants' hall about eight, as a sort of finish. I didn't go to bed. I got my work done and got on as well as I could, but I was very sleepy. William Thompson was here all day and he assisted me to wash up all the glasses and that. The day passed, passed over very heavy. Christmas wasn't a holiday for the servants. Sometimes they might be allowed upstairs to watch the family entertainment, charades and that sort of thing, but certainly not to join in. In fact, it was often a time when there was a lot of extra work to be done, especially if the family had guests staying. Some households actually hired extra staff at Christmas. Here's Hannah Cullick describing one of her Christmases. The master had a hot mince pie with a ring and a sixpence in it. Oh, they had good fun over it, because Mr Grant got the ring and a young lady the sixpence. We had no fun downstairs, all was very busy till four o'clock and then to bed. But at least if you had a decent employer, you could at least expect a decent Christmas dinner. Frederick Gorse, the footman, describes his. 
A large Christmas dinner was served at midday in the servants' hall, which had been specially decorated for the occasion. Dinner was served at four long tables and wooden benches. It started with a hog's head stuffed with sausage meat and pâté de foie gras and a shiny red apple in its mouth. Next, cold meats and joints of beef with Yorkshire pudding. Then, plum pudding flaming with brandy. The feast lasted for most of the afternoon and by the time everyone had left the servants' hall, Mr Ling the butler and I were almost too tired to serve Christmas dinner for the family and their guests. Employers always seem to be complaining about their servants. Here's Daniel Defoe, writing in 1725. If any menial servant should swear at or curse to his face, their master or mistress, from whom they receive wages, or strike or offer to strike, or threaten their said masters or mistresses, they should upon conviction be transported for 21 years not to be in the master's power to remit the sentence and the master not prosecuting to forfeit five hundred pounds. Merely to put a servant in the stocks is no use. All his footman friends from the alehouse will bring chairs and ale, commiserate with him, curse their masters and go away leaving their captive comrade too drunk to appreciate his shame. Jonathan Swift also had a very low opinion of servants, although he had a very different way of criticising them. Published in 1745, his Directions to Servants is a satirical piece. It pokes fun at all the outrageous things he's seen servants doing over the years. Here is his very much tongue-in-cheek advice to footmen on how to behave when serving at the dining table. At table, the footman wears no socks because, as most ladies like the smell of young men's toes, so it is a sovereign remedy against the vapours. He holds spare plates under his armpits or tucks them between his waistcoat and his shirt. He takes the chairs from behind the company during grace so that they fall on the floor, which will make all merry, and breaks lobster claws in the hinges of the dining room door. He also gives a list of possible excuses that footmen could use if they're late returning from running an errand or an afternoon off. A brother servant that borrowed money off you when he was out of place was running away to Ireland. You were taking leave of a dear cousin who is to be hanged next Saturday. You wrenched your foot against a stone and were forced to stay three hours in a shop before you could stir a step. Some nastiness was thrown on you out of a garret window and you were ashamed to come home before you were cleaned and the smell went off. But what about romances, affairs, seductions? Well, for most servants, particularly females, there wasn't much chance to meet people outside their own household unless they were nurses or nannies, and it was part of their job to take their charges out around parks, etc. Henry Mayhew, writing in 1861, thought that it was soldiers and policemen who were the usual objects of maid's affections. Soldiers are particularly notorious for hunting up these women, especially nursemaids and others that in the execution of their duty, walk in the parks, when they may easily be accosted. Nursemaids feel flattered by the attention that is lavished upon them and are always ready to succumb to the scarlet fever. A red coat is powerful with this class, who prefer a soldier to a servant or any other description of man they come into contact with. But in reality, it was more likely to be butchers, milkmen, tradesmen who called at the house that maids would come into contact with, and occasionally romances blossomed. Within the house, male and female servants were very strictly kept apart, but again, occasionally a romance might blossom. In 1910, 
a footman called Gerald Horne courted the head kitchen maid Nellie and eventually they're married. But here he is talking about their courtship. We hadn't to be seen talking, so we used to leave notes under the lamp room mat. Or we'd get up at four in the morning and slip out for a walk in the woods. It was sometimes possible for us to meet secretly outside for a few minutes in the evening. And neither of us will ever forget the time when Nelly, having as usual nipped out of the larder window, went to cross a five foot plank which the builders had left to cover a trench. It had been a very wet day and Nelly, in pale blue, slipped in. And I had a devil of a tug of war with the mud before we, it would let her go. So marriage between servants did sometimes happen. But marriage between an employer and a servant was extremely rare. <clears throat> However, very occasionally, even this happened. In the 18th century, an attorney to the Exchequer married his cookmaid, much to the disgust of his friend Boswell. There is something I think particularly indelicate and disgusting in the idea of a cookmaid. Imagination can easily cherish a fondness for a pretty chambermaid or a dairymaid, but one is revolted by the greasiness and scorching connected with the wench who toils in the kitchen. In 1785, the fifth Earl of Berkeley tricked a lady's maid, Mary Cole, into believing that he'd married her when in fact he hadn't. I don't know how he did that, but anyway, she went on to bear him seven children before he actually married her and made her an honest countess of her. The eldest son, being illegitimate and deprived of the title, was said to lead such a dissolute life that he actually fathered 33 bastards within 10 miles of Barclay Castle and no mother would allow her daughter into his service. Occasionally you hear of high-born ladies marrying one of their men servants. In 1764, Horace Walpole disseminated the news that Lord Rockingham's sister, Lady Henrietta Wentworth, had stooped lower than a theatric swain and married her footman, John William Sturgeon. It is supposed she is with child by him for they used to pass many hours together, which she called teaching John the mathematics. A Mrs. Charlton of Hesleyside in Northumbria had a butler who led a number of women astray, and it was only much later in life that she found out what had really been going on in the laundry. It was not, in fact, until the winter of 1893 when I went down to Brighton on the sad occasion of my eldest son's last illness that I really got to know the truth. For he talked much of the olden days at Hesley side when he was but a boy and of much of the scandals in the laundry which, according to him, was nothing but a brothel. He gave the names of some of the upper servants as among the most licentious women of whom I had no suspicion, believing them to lead blameless lives. It horrified me, so long ago as that, to hear about the scenes of profligacy he himself witnessed as he passed the laundry to and fro at odd times of the day, and I had no doubt, although he did not say so, that he was simile au fait at the indoor servants and moors in the butler's pantry. If a female servant was found to have become pregnant, she would be instantly dismissed without a character. That means without a reference. So she'd find it impossible to find another job. And if her family wouldn't have her back, well, she'd end up in the workhouse. And that was such a, a dreaded prospect that women would go to any lengths to conceal a pregnancy and even the birth. The Diary of a Country Parson 1758-1802. Dr. Clark's maid, Mary, was this morning found out in concealing a dead child in her box, of which she had delivered herself yesterday morning. Whether she murdered it or not is not yet known. Sarah Drake was a cook housekeeper in Harley Street, London. She had a, an illegitimate child 
who was farmed out from birth. That's a Victorian expression, meaning that she paid someone to look after it. When the child reached the age of two, Sarah owed that woman 11 or 12 pounds, a lot of money in the middle of the 19th century, and she couldn't afford it. She could never afford to pay it off. So she strangled the child. She put the body in a box, sealed it up, gave it to the butler to address. He wouldn't have known what was in it, of course, and sent it by rail to her sister in Cheshire. There was no note in the box, but it was traced back to her. She was put on trial for murder in 1849. Now, during the trial, it came to light that she'd had a previous illegitimate child, which she'd also killed. That was in 1842. On that occasion, she'd been found not guilty of murder, but guilty of the concealment of a birth. On that occasion, she'd also put the body in a box and sent it to the master of the Nutsford Union. Now, this brings us on to criminality. I don't want you to think that most servants were criminals, but petty theft was always a temptation. Stealing quite small things that they thought the employers wouldn't notice, perhaps a pat of butter, rabbit skins. Actually, cooks were entitled to keep rabbit skins, but rabbit skins could be used to conceal other things. Another thing was the use of the master's equipment or vehicles. The Earl of Athlone on one occasion, his coachman was caught using the coach for his own purposes. He was dismissed and after dismissal, he had the nerve to ask for a reference. Well, this is the reference that he got. He behaved to me in a most insolent and rascally manner and ill-treating my horses by driving them about the streets for his own amusement at a time when they ought to have been in the stable, having ordered the carriage home. The evening previous to my turning him out of my house, he bid me be damned and drive my own carriage, and because I would not pay him for a month's wages and board wages, he sent me an attorney's letter. He has contracted debts in this neighbourhood for which he will be arrested and robbed me of a pair of fustian small clothes, which he took with him. I wish to prevent you or any other gentleman from being imposed upon by such fellows, makes me inform you of this man's bad conduct. Well, very, very, very occasionally, you hear of a case of murder. Perhaps a servant's been ill-treated over a period of time, or feel that they've been done an injustice, and decide to take matters into their own hands. One such case appears to have been a maid called Kate Webster. Kate worked for a Richmond widow, Mrs Thomas. She'd only worked for her a month when she was dismissed for shoddy work. Well, that must have upset her. On the 2nd of March, 1879, Kate came back from her Sunday afternoon off, the worse for drink. She had a big row with Mrs Thomas and then Mrs Thomas went out to the evening Sunday service at the church. When she came back, Kate bludgeoned her to death and then cut up the body and boiled the bits on the stove. The neighbours only suspected something when Kate started trying to sell off the furniture. Kate ran away to Ireland, but she was eventually traced and brought back, tried found guilty and hanged. But I wouldn't want you to go away with the impression that servants were all like that. Most of them were very honest, hardworking and loyal, and far more sinned against than sinning. However, we're going to give the last word to Jonathan Swift. Here's his advice to footmen on how to end their service. The footman will try not to grow old in office, which is the highest of indignities. Therefore, when you find the years coming on without hopes of a place at court, a, a command in the army, a succession to the stewardship, an employment in the revenue, or running away with the master's niece or daughter, I directly advise you to go upon the road, that is, to become a highwayman. 
which is the only post of honour left to you. There you will meet with many of your old comrades and live a short life and a merry one and make a figure at your exit. Thank you.